when we're talking about stimuli, um, you guys have to realize that there are different types of stimuli, okay? So there's verbal. So verbal just means that you're talking to them. You wake up, um, you walk in, you say, good morning, Mrs. Smith. They open their eyes. That's verbal stimuli, okay? You also have to realize there's tactile stimuli. Tactile stimuli would be you walk in, you say their name, Mrs. Smith, no response. So what do you do? You go over and you gently, you know, shake their shoulder. They wake up. That's tactile stimuli. But then you have to understand that there's what we call deep. Deep stimuli. You walk in, Mrs. Smith, no response. You go over and shake her, no response. Mrs. Smith won't wake up. And so you use what we call deep stimuli. And a lot of times deep stimuli is used interchangeably with what we call painful stimuli. Painful stimuli would be, for instance, that we would take an object and press it on their nail bed to see what type of response that do we get from them. Do they have purposeful a purposeful response where they withdraw or try and get away from the painful stimuli, or do they not react to it at all? Other forms of painful stimuli that you could see but are not acceptable are sternal rubbing where you actually take the knuckles on one of your hands and you actually rub the patient's sternum causing friction on the skin and a possible break, skin breakdown. And then there are times when you'll actually see um, healthcare practitioners pinch nipples and see what type of response they get. The acceptable form of painful stimuli is to take an object such as a pen or a pencil and press it against the nail beds firmly and see what type of response you get. As you can see, there can be a lot to a neurological exam. It can be quite extensive. This chart here is called a dermatone chart. A dermatone chart is necessary when there is an issue, when a patient has possible numbness, tingling, or even loss of feeling. Remember, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and each pair has both a sensory and a motor path, right? And so when you're actually checking uh, these spinal nerves, you're checking can they move, all right? But not just can they move, can they also feel, which is sensory. And so when they lose sensation, for instance, that's sensory, and then there is a dermatone chart that you can actually document by. For instance, if we would enlarge this, you would see that like right at the nipples, is what we call T2, okay? And so for instance, if a patient lost all sensation at T2, that's what we would document. You can see essentially the groin area is usually about S1 or S2. So if the patient lost feeling at approximately the groin area, we would document S1, S2 as far as their lack of sensation or a lack of movement. And so that is called a dermatome chart. It's extremely useful, for instance, when someone has had spinal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia, and we need to document the progression of this uh, anesthesia wearing off. Perception difficulties, you wanna um, document if a patient is, for instance, having difficulty with perception, depth perception, visual and auditory disturbances, these can all be suggestive of cranial nerve issues. All right, I'm not gonna go through all the cranial nerves. You guys should know these, the cranial nerves, all but the first uh, cranial nerve run off the brainstem, so that's when we hate to have brainstem in injuries because then you can lose or not have intact cranial nerves. You guys can read through these. They start on page 13, 46, 47. Um, from what I understand, you learned these last year, so just go through, learn the basic, relearn the basic information. For instance, the first one, the olfactory sense of smell, so you would want to, you know, check the patient's ability to smell, like seven, facial, can they frown, can they smile, can they raise their eyebrows. So go up, make sure that you read through these and understand the test for each. This just finishes up the cranial nerves. So once again, read through these few pages. They end up, for instance, on 1348. 
uh, with the hypoglossal um, cranial nerve. That's where, you know, you just ask the patient, for instance, to stick their tongue out and move it from side to side. We've already talked about uh, sensory and motor function. How you would um, evaluate sensory is have a variety of items such as like a pen or a cotton or a Q-tip. Make sure they can feel touch, uh, sense of position, discrimi discriminate between fine and uh, more coarse touch, and make sure that you check bilaterally, and you would do the same thing for motor. Uh, for the uh, cerebellum, you would uh, check their gait and check the Romberg's test, their uh, sense of coordination. And then reflexes, that's really advanced practitioner assessment technique. You guys can see on page 13, 48, 49, where they talk about reflexes. Um, you can see that there's different types of reflexes um, that you would use, and then you would rate them. But to really to become proficient in reflexes, you actually have to do them quite frequently. So we're not going to learn reflexes. That's more for advanced nurse practitioner information. Just a testing graphesthesia is just nothing more than the ability to recognize writing on the skin purely by the sense of touch. So this is actually checking sensation. This is testing two-point discrimination. So for instance, can they feel that there are actually two different points here from the Q-tips, or do they just sense it as one? So this is where you would actually do one Q-tip. They would say, okay, there's just one item. Then you change it to two, and there'd be two items. And once again, this is checking uh, for sensation. One way to test coordination is you can have them lie down or stand and do where they do, they take their heel and run it down their shin. And this is testing muscular coordination. There's a lot of different ways to test muscu muscular uh, coordination. You can use your hands, have them put their hands in a prone position, and then have them uh, quickly go prone, uh, supinate, prone, supinate, prone, supinate, that test muscle coordination also. We do actually study meningitis, so a couple of assessment techniques that you guys need to be aware of that suggest um, irritation of the meninges are called Brzezinski's. This is when a patient who you suspect might have a meningitis or a meningeal irritation, you actually flex the patient's neck forward, and this causes flexion at the patient's hips and knees because it's painful, so they draw up their knees. And then we have Koenig's sign, and this is where the patient's laying down, and we actually flex the, patient, flex the patient's hip at a 90-degree angle, and this actually um, causes pain at the knee, and the patient is unable to straighten their knee because of the meningeal ir irritation. Earlier when we were talking about deeper painful stimuli, and I said you could possibly get posturing, these are the two different types of posturing that you need to look for. So for instance, if someone's not responsive and you take and you apply nail bed pressure, you're looking to see if they're having posturing and so decerebrate posturing is when they extend. They extend their arms down to their sides and they um, extend their wrist straighten and their fist point outwards versus decorticate posturing where the patient flexes. They actually bring their arms into their core and that's called decorticate posturing. Okay, a couple of diagnostics. We're on page 1352. First is the LP lumbar puncture. There are a lot, a lot of reasons to do an LP. Um, so essentially, the physician is going between the vertebrae. So uh, anyway, fetal position, if the patient is unable to uh, sit or the sitting position is good for an LP, the main thing is, is the patient remains still. They're cooperative. Um, remind, patients often are you know, worried about getting spinal cord injury from an LP. Just remember, you know, your spinal cord ends like L1, L2, and we're going below that. We're typically going at like L3, L4, L4, L5. So remind your patient of that. We need to go <clears throat> into 
and actually pierce the meninges and get a cerebral spinal fluid. And so we are concerned um, about a post-spinal headache where the actual dura doesn't seal and we have a continuous leak of spinal fluids. And so what they typically do for that is they do a more lateral approach with the needle and use a smaller needle so hopefully it will seal. Um, the cerebral spinal fluid is then collected and can be sent for a multitude of different types of tests. You should not do an LP on someone has, that has suspected increased intracranial pressure. It can, cause what we, it can lead to what we call herniation. Uh, Postoperatively, uh, the patient needs to be monitored. Uh, they need to be um, on bed rest for a certain period of time. They need to be encouraged to drink uh, large amounts of fluid to replace the CSF and to know what a spinal headache feels like. And the spinal headache essentially is one that um, develops because the dura didn't seal. There's a continuous leak of CSF fluid. And so if you can't keep up with the production of CSF fluid and you're losing too much CSF fluid, then there's not enough cushion for the brain. And so then the patient went up, whether it be sitting or up walking around, develop a very severe headache. But when um, they go to lay back down because there's more equalization spreading out of the CSF, the headache subsides or is minimalized. And those are, that is signs and symptoms of a cerebral spinal headache that they would then need to be um, told, report that to the physician. Someone who develops a CSF headache or a spinal headache is often just told bed rest, lots of fluid, caffeinated beverages. If that doesn't resolve the issue, then possibly a blood patch. The other slide is just shown a cerebral angiogram, angiography. This is also on page 1352. We've spent a lot of time talking about angiograms, and so this is one where we just want to take a good look at the cerebral arteries and see if we can identify blockage. You guys know the drill. You know that there's going to most likely be a femoral puncture site that has to be monitored postoperatively for bleeding. Um, make sure the leg doesn't fall off. The patient's probably received some sedation. Make sure that their vitals are stable and that they have an adequate level of consciousness before they get up. Uh, preoperatively, they're going to get contrast medium. Are they allergic? What's their BUN and creatinine look up like? And then postoperatively, they need to get adequate fluids because we need to get this dye out of their body.